if I wanted to practice forms or kicks. I didn't need anybody else to do those things. Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in, for stopping by, for whatever you want to call it. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 314. And today, we're joined by a guest with a passion for a martial arts weapon you probably know very little about. His name is Mr. Frank Hatsis. My name is Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host for the show. I'm the founder at Whistlekick, and we make stuff for traditional martial artists, whether it's apparel or sparring gear or, yes, the development of a number of other products, only one of which I will tell you about right now. I'm not even going to tell you about it. I'm just going to say, we're working on uniforms. That's all I'm saying. But there's a lot more to say, a lot more to read, see. Check out at whistlekick.com. All of our products are over there. And of course, the show notes for this show are at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. When I first started talking to Mr. Hatzis, we were talking about his journey in the martial arts, but also his passion for the rope dart. Now, you've probably seen this in kung fu movies, or maybe you've witnessed some folks training with it in a kung fu school. But at least according to our guest today, it goes so much deeper than most of us realize. Of course, Mr. Hatzis didn't start his training with the rope dart, so we've got the whole context of who he is and what led up to him discovering that this this very specific piece in his martial arts, I guess, arsenal was the piece that he wanted to focus his life, his profession on. I'm not going to tell you anymore. I'm going to let him talk about it. So here we are with Mr. Frank Hatzis. Mr. Hatzis, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Hey, good morning. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. Good morning. You know, I didn't, I didn't even ask you, am I pronouncing your last name correctly? Uh, you are... Pretty much one of the only uh, guys out there that is pronouncing it correctly. Oh. It is, yeah, it's Hatsis. It's like you'd wear a hat on your head and somebody would call their sister Sis. <laughs> okay. So you get Hatsis. And the amount of people that can, the types of things that comes out of people's mouths with something that is so easy to pronounce is uh, pretty incredible. So you're actually, you nailed it, my friend. Well, I apologize. Normally I ask ahead of time and, you know, listeners, I always try to, talk about this with folks. And actually, in the very, very first version of the guest form, there was a place where the guest would write out their name phonetically. But I found that people had a harder time writing out their name phonetically than, than I had just asking and saying, hey, could, could, you, could you tell me? But I'm, I'm looking at your name and I'm wondering, what else, how else would they say your last name? Uh, well, sometimes the the most common thing is that obviously there's the S I S. So forget one of usually the first S. They'll say Haddis. Um, uh, I've gotten Haskis. Like they switch the S and the T. Mm. I don't know. I you know whatever. It's just people. <laughs> you know. You know. It's human error. I'm I'm guilty of it too. Uh, but normally, for whatever reason, people do have a challenge with it and. You just kind of knew it, and I, my thought is, it seems like it's pretty easy to pronounce. But I've got to say, you know, yeah, it's a pretty straightforward yeah. name, and 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 I understand, you know, names. I think there's a correlation there between the way people identify with a name and the way people identify with their their martial art of choice. You know, I've seen so many people really? get so defensive. You know, the moment oh, right. anyone oh. says anything negative about. And, and I guess this, this transcends martial arts, something that they have done. You know, we're, we're in this very tribalistic society. Media, you know, feels feels like they're doing a great job. I'd say they're doing a, a pretty bang up job of pushing us into these camps, you know, where we have to stand up. We have to identify. And a name for a lot of people is like that. But of course, my name, uh, if you've ever tried to type my name into a phone, it autocorrects to something that's that's rather far away from a name and uh yeah so. dare i ask what uh what gets <laughs> what comes up so well, it so, so starts I with les I'm <laughs> right gotcha right um, um you know so i heard it all through school and and you know i got to a point where my my identity actually became strongly dissociated from my name not that i i don't like my name my first name my middle name my last name i mean they're they're all fine names 
but I had so many nicknames and so many variations. Yeah, I had a couple of nicknames I didn't care about uh, much myself. And just so I, I'm clear, I'm pronouncing your last name correctly as Lesniak. That's right. All right. And, and maybe it's the again. fact that you, you're you a New Yorker. Both sides of my family are from Long Island. So we'll, we'll, we'll chalk it up to that and your uh, familiarity. But I, have, I have roots deep into Hicksville. Oh, okay. Sure. So I'm originally from Franklin Square, so not too far from Hicksville at all. I have no idea. I've, I, my my parents moved out, and then grandparents moved out when I was when I was young. I mean, I, I have memories being there, but not very many of them. But if you yeah, say it's I, nearby, I mean, I'll take your word for it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I have a a lot of fond memories growing up on Long Island. It has its you know, it has its ups and downs, just like everywhere else. But it was a it was a really pleasant place to grow up. Good family life, good people. No complaints as to where uh, I grew up. Got to be honest with you. All right. Well, of course, we are not here to talk about our mutual New York lineage. We're here to talk about martial arts. So we start in a pretty basic way, almost a cliche way. And I'll just ask you, how did you find martial arts? Well, you know, the way I found martial arts is I think a way a lot of people my age found martial arts and that was through the teenage mutant ninja turtles and it was you know i look back and i reflect on it and you know icons like bruce lee was way before my time and some of the more i don't know commercial kid-friendly stuff like the power rangers was after my time but the teenage mutant ninja turtles was right during my time and uh i guess that it allowed me to first off use my imagination and you know dive into that that headspace where kids play and they act like their favorite characters i was of course michelangelo i love the flexible weapons but you know we also had our friends in our neighborhood my brother was leonardo and our other friend was Raphael, and our other friend was donatello so i think the the teenage mutant ninja turtles not only allowed you to use your imagination to be a ninja and all this cool stuff but it also allowed you to play with your neighborhood friends who were also into the same thing. And, and where did it go from there? Uh, well, from there, uh, me and my brother just started practicing on each other and kind of beating the crap out of each other. And uh, <laughs> my mother finally decided that maybe it was time to enroll us in a, a martial arts school. So we enrolled in Shin Taekwondo, and that was Grandmaster Shun Ak Shin. Uh, you know, a Korean gentleman, and he had a school there in Stewart Manor, which is a town over from Franklin Square. My brother and I would actually ride our bicycles there. And that's pretty much where my my official martial arts journey began within like the discipline of being in a school and going through a, a ranking system, if you will. Now, this was an old school guy, so this was not a belt factory. And you had to be extremely proficient in what you were doing in order to get your next belt. And I remember belt ceremonies where he did not pass people. And that had to have been, I think, maybe a little bit embarrassing, especially us as Americans, to be up there. You know, you're basically walking up after you've done all your things. And Grandmaster Shin is either giving you the thumbs up or thumbs down with regard to your progression. And I was I witnessed some people not progressing. And you got to lower your head and walk away and the next person goes up and they get their, their judgment, if you will. Maybe that's a strong word, but. And what was it about martial arts that, that you dug? I mean, you know, here you're, you're playing right. Ninja um, Turtles, you know, and then you step into a real class. I mean, was it, was it what you were expecting? Did it grab it you? or? Cool. Okay. Yeah, Keep yeah. Go. I, it was way cooler than what I was expecting. Um, and, you know, what's, I think I say, so just to back up a little bit, uh, you know, growing up as a lot of little kids do, I had some confidence issues, some self-esteem issues. I was picked on by other people. And, you know, I, it's not a woe is me tale. That's uh, a lot of kids can say that stuff. And with martial arts, the cool thing was is that I didn't need anybody else really to practice. Of course, I could get together with my friends and we could play and this and that. But when I wanted to practice like uh, nunchucks, I just needed me and two sticks tied together. 
Uh, if I wanted to practice forms or kicks, I didn't need anybody else to do those things. Uh, whereas if I got together with friends to play, say, flag football or touch football, if I messed up, everybody pointed their finger at, at me or at somebody else. And, they, you know, and it's just growing up. I'm not like hung up on this stuff. But, you know, being in martial arts allowed me the freedom to be uh, who I was, to practice how I wanted to practice, when I wanted to practice. And if others were around, maybe with whom I wanted to practice. So there was that, that definitely attracted me to the martial arts. I, I, I guess that I didn't need anybody else's permission or I didn't have to meet somebody else's standard in order to engage in the activity. Now, of course, I'm going to foreshadow here a little bit because I know we're going to talk about martial arts that are not Taekwondo as we move forward. So how long were you at that school? I stayed in Taekwondo for about, I want to, I mean, this is, I was real young, but I want to say about six or seven years. Uh, I made it all the way to a third degree brown belt, which, you know, whatever, you know, belts are belts, but that's, you know, just to give an indication of how long I was there as a youth. And I ended up uh, discovering Choi Lei Foot Kung Fu, or in Mandarin, they say Kai Li Fo. And uh, I fell in love with Kung Fu instantly because, uh, you know, I was already kind of playing with weapons on my own. And then I found a school that actually taught weapons. And I was like, oh, my God, I, I, I got to jump in on this. So uh, I ended up leaving Taekwondo and joining uh, Master Perella's Kung Fu Centers, which was a Choi Lei Foot and Lama Pai uh, mix from the, the Chan Tai San lineage of, uh, of Toy San, if you will. Okay. And what was that transition like? You know, and, and if I may ask, how old were you when you switched? I was about, I would say, 13 going on 14, approximately, when I was switching. And again, this is, we're talking well over 20 years ago. Uh, okay. Some of my dates might be a little bit off, but I'm, I'm okay. trying to reflect as accurately as I possibly can. I was about 13, 14. I'll, I'll say 14 years old when I made the switch from Taekwondo to Choi Lei Foot Kung Fu. Okay, well... You know, this isn't going in any kind of an affidavit, so we don't need to pin you down to exact years or, or dates or anything like that. So here you are, you're, you're training in Taekwondo, you're practicing weapons on your own. You find this school that has weapons as part of the curriculum, and, and you're excited, and you jump in there. And what was it like? It was, so as cool as training in Taekwondo was for me, I felt like I took for lack of a better way to say it, the next step up in cool. And that same feeling, you know, I like a, um, a structured approach to things. So I never had a challenge with standing on a spot and repeating the same techniques over and over to refine them, to master them. And I use that term very loosely um, because I haven't mastered anything yet. Um, but to really hone in those skills, I, you know, I think one thing I will say is that whatever successes I've had with regard to martial arts is I actually enjoy repeating and drilling the same thing over and over and over again. So to find a school that was continuously, you know, drilling these concepts as well as adding weapons to those drilling. And, and I, I don't know, I'm, I'm actually, I have a smile on my face as I reflect on it. It was a really, really special time in my life. And the feeling of it was, like I was just another, you know, uh, a monk at the Shaolin Temple around all these other monks, and we we're all going through our forms, and everything was was on point and timed properly, and it was, you know, it was obviously forms of choreographed, and it, it it just it it has a a feeling in me that I guess I'm I'm finding it a little bit challenging to describe right now, but uh, it just felt good, and I, I tend to stick with things that feel good. Mm. I can hear a slight shift as you're talking about this school versus this, this, the first school, you know, and not to take anything away from your Taekwondo school. Anyone who's a long-term listener to the show knows, I firmly believe, you know, all arts have value and the best thing is to find the art, the school that works best for you. But it sounds Agreed. good. I'm glad. I'm glad you yeah. agree. <laughs> but what in, in hearing your voice, it almost sounds like you would call this second school home. Like you found a place that you belonged and maybe you didn't even realize 
from the first school that it could be that much better. I would say that's a very accurate way to uh, to put that, and it it, it was it, it did feel like home. So when I, when I do speak to people and they ask me, you know, what style, you know, the the same conversations, you know, what style was your seafood, all that stuff. Um, I always say Choi Lei Foot Kung Fu, and I say, and and I took Taekwondo as a kid, and I was there for you know years, um, but really my home was, and I still feel like my home is in. Uh, Choi Lei Foot Kung Fu, when I compete or when I bring students to compete, we compete in Chinese weapons divisions, Chinese form divisions, uh, Chinese fighting, you know, Sam Da, you're familiar with divisions. I don't, I, you know, I, I don't have much, uh, I would even say familiar, familiarity anymore with regard to Taekwondo. Uh, I, I really don't. I, I A lot of it, I, I left with a lot of the solid, the basics, the foundations. And as you stated, I agree firmly that there's something to be gained from every martial art. And it really is finding the one that, that works for you personally. And, um, and Taekwondo did work for me, but Choi Lei Foot Kung Fu worked better, if that makes sense. It does. And I think most people that have trained in multiple styles would agree that, you know, there's, there's always going to be a special place in their heart for the, the first style they trained in. Right. But that doesn't mean that that is the best place for them. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that what you want, what you need as a human being practicing martial arts doesn't change as you gauge. Yeah, I, I, I sure. I agree uh, 100% on that. Um, All right. Absolutely. Uh, from uh, from there, though, from the, um, the Choi Lei Foot, I actually ended up studying Muay Thai under uh, Ray Longo. And I did that for, I don't know, five, six, again, seven-ish years. Maybe my golden number is about seven years that I before I switched to another art. But, um, and that's when I was doing more uh, amateur Muay Thai fighting. And I, that, that is the martial art that I truly, truly fell in love with as a fighting system. Uh, I like, uh, I, I think every martial art, you know, has its fighting application. If you, you know, if people understand what the application really is. I think most applications that people their applications are a little bit too Mickey Mouse and, you know, real applications are pretty dirty and nasty. But um, but Muay Thai is where I really learned how to fight. And I, I attribute that to guys like Ray Longo, Luke Kumo, um, Dave Patton. I mean, these guys are just they were always top of the game and they shared their knowledge. You know what I loved about Muay Thai? as opposed to Kung Fu was that Kung Fu every, you know, a lot of times there's, Oh, I have this secret thing. And if you train with me, I'll teach you the secret thing and, you know, wash the floors and this, that, and the other thing for Muay Thai, you walked in and they're like, no, we're getting you ready for a fight. You need to know what's going on. And here are all the tricks of the trade. Here's all the basics. Here's the stuff that works. Discard the stuff that doesn't. So I had a couple of uh, amateur Muay Thai fights under uh, Ray Longo. And I was successful in some, not as successful in, in others. But it was, uh, that's where I really learned how to fight. And obviously that's what martial arts is, is fighting. So Nice. All right, so that gives us a great context, a foundation for who you are, for the other things we're going to talk about as we weave through the story that is your path in the martial arts. One of the things I love to talk about here on the show is stories. I see the world... In terms of stories, really, I think all we have is history of the stories that we tell other people. And I'd love to know, when you reflect on your time as a martial artist, what is your favorite story that you tell? Ah, the favorite one of, oh, gee, wow. Favorite story, favorite story. I guess one of my favorite stories to tell, and it's because people ask me, is how I got introduced to the rope dart and it's kind of a long story and it's a lot of seemingly odd events that took place that actually led to me having a rope dart and learning a rope dart and things of that nature but though that it, again this was over months and months of time of the right people the right circumstances just falling into place um a real easy story would be uh, the first time that I did fight for Ray and I won, and I just remember uh, the calmness I had during the all three rounds, 
I remember despite the crowd, you know, yelling and cheering and booing and whatever it was, being able to actually block all of that out. And I only heard Ray's voice. That was it. Out of a huge venue, everybody screaming. One voice that I heard was Ray's, and he wasn't even yelling that loud. I just was able to tune in on him. And not only that, he was obviously coaching me, and it was the first time where somebody was telling me what to do in real time, and I was calm enough and of sound mind enough, and I was executing everything he was saying. And I remember he would say something, I would do it, and he'd be like, yeah! And every single time he cheered for me, it just, oh my, it put something in my heart to make me go bigger, better, faster, more. And it was like, he just kept feeding fuel into my fire. Um, just by him saying, yeah, cause you know, I, you know, a marshal, like, what do we want? We want our seafood to be proud of us. We want to make our seafood happy. That's why we do the extra push-ups. That's why we're kicking the bag hundreds of times. We want to make our seafood happy. And, uh, you know, and Ray is an awesome guy. I mean, he's probably one of the nicest guys you could ever meet. So he was generally a happy guy anyway. But that he was that happy for me specifically in that moment, uh, I'm actually getting goosebumps on my arm right now. I wish you could see it. I mean, that, that to me was just a, an amazing night. Uh, I ended up winning. You know, I, I won the fight, as I, as I mentioned, um, against a bigger opponent. And, you know, all those things that make it a magical event just came into place. But whatever reason, man, just hearing Ray Longo talk directly to me and tell me exactly what he wanted me to do and my having the wherewithal to execute exactly what he was saying in real time in a combat situation, that left an impression on me for my entire life. It really did. Wow. Now, anyone that's competed has likely experienced the exact opposite of that. In fact, I remember in my early days of competition, even in forums competition, I would go blank. I would fall completely onto my training, onto the way that I had done that form hundreds of times, and I was not present. Obviously, being present in life in general is a good thing. And here you're telling us a story about how you were so present, you were able to adapt on the fly to take the feedback from your instructor and to implement it with success. I'm going to assume that this wasn't something that happened automatically it came with some experience with s developing some comfort in the ring is that is that fair to say it's yeah absolutely fair to say okay. um you know anybody that knows ray longo knows that he produces the best fighters on the planet so leading up to any of my fights i was you know locked in either the cage that we had there or in the ring with you know your choice of an animal and you know i got my my butt kicked many, 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 many times, a hundred times to the one time that I actually had the opportunity to kick butt. And I feel that Ray knows how to prepare people for, you know, it, it's beyond that. It, it's the nerves. It's, you know, dealing with all, you know, it's an amateur fight. So it's not like I'm getting paid for it. I still have to deal with paying rent, you know, going to school. The girlfriend's mad at me. Oh, also, you got to get in the ring and have some guy that really wants to kick the air come face to face with you and Ray was able to prepare you for all of that so that you could stay calm. And yes, experience certainly helps. I wasn't that, that in tune my first couple of times that I fought under Ray. And then to have that moment, it was, I, I felt like a shift in my overall training. And that was when I realized that I could be in the heat of battle and I could be so calm that you'd think I was asleep. So were you able to take that presence, that calm demeanor in the, the face of fire outside of the ring? Uh, yes. I, I think that's probably one of the biggest benefits that I was able to uh, draw from it is that I don't, I don't get so uppity in a, in a, you know, if there's an aggressive confrontation, I don't get as, Oh, you know, uh, you know, people that have never fought, they're the ones that are so willing to fight all the time. The guys that have actually gotten their butt kicked many, many, many times ain't so quick to fight because they know exactly what happens. So, uh, you know, that either one of you gets hurt, both of you gets hurt, you both might go to jail, you know, any, any list of things that could go wrong. So I think that being able to stay calm, diffuse, any kind of a situation before it, it escalates to that level. Uh, I think I got that ability from, from training 
uh, with Ray. It's called it's called Law MMA now. Uh, when I was training there, living on Long Island, it was Ray Longo's International Martial Arts Academy. Great stuff. Yeah. Now, outside of martial arts, you know, is there anything that you're really passionate about? Uh, no, nah, not really. I mean, the rope thought <laughs> as a as a martial art thing. Uh, yeah, I don't have a balanced life. I know that everybody says, oh, you need a balanced life. It's like, yeah, but not if you're trying to do something big. So in other words, if I split my time up between the rope start and say, I really like to cook. And now I'm also trying to become some great chef. Both of those things are going to fail because I'm not, because I, well, I'm balanced. So oh, I have half my time here, half my time there, but I don't think that you can grow a proper plant by only watering it half the time. You got to water that plant all the time or it's not going to grow. So Ooh, I like that. I, um, yeah, I don't actually have too many other things that I'm into in life other than the rope. So the rope start is my life. And I say that very happily. I don't know that too many people get to do what they want with their life the way they want to. And I'm, uh, you know, I, I struggle. Don't get me wrong. It's not a it's not rainbows and sunshine. But, um, you know, I get to speak with, uh, you know, guys like you and I get to meet some pretty amazing people and have some amazing experiences. But just before I get too off topic, no, I, I don't really have too many other things. I like to study the laws of the universe, the way the universe works. That I'm, that's something I'm very interested in. Um, but other than that, no, my life is extremely one-sided. I, I rope dart. That's what I do. <laughs> you are not the only one. In fact, just off the top of my head, if I reflect back on the guests who have answered this question, a lot of them will share other things, but you can just hear it in their voice that they're afraid of sounding one dimensional. And then of course we have plenty of folks such as yourself who say, no martial arts in whatever flavor is my passion. It is my life. And we've even had some folks kind of take what you've said that, you know, you, you only get a great plan if you water it full time, you know, really investing that time. We've had some say that that is the way, the only way to practice martial arts. So I, I don't think you're in, in poor company here. Okay, perfect. Well, you know, there's, there's so, so many people, it's kind of like the party line. If somebody, you're at a party, you're talking with two of your friends, and one of them says, oh, you know, they have this problem, this problem, this problem, whatever's going on in their life. And the other friend is like, oh, well, you need to find balance. We need to balance things. Everybody goes to this, this you know, the shotgun approach of you need balance. And I'm saying, no, you don't know. Like, yeah, oh, okay, sure. Yeah. You, you need, you got to eat too. You got to sleep fine, whatever. But if you want to do something great in this life, there's no time for balance in, in the sense that we're speaking of right now. It, 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 it's all or nothing for, for me anyway. And I'm happy to hear you have other guests that feel the same way. Um, it's all or nothing because if you don't put in a hundred percent of what you're look, I'm trying to spread the rope dart across the world. Now that's a bold freaking statement to make. And if I was busy trying to figure out how to make a souffle, I ain't spreading the rope dart across the world, you know? So mm. it, it, it really is about finding that th for me anyway, if you want to be on that level and find something that's great. And if you want to leave a legacy, there's no room for balance. There's finding that thing that makes you happy and and going with it and not stopping and not listening to anybody else because uh, people are going to say no, but you don't, you know, you just, you go for it. I understand. And I agree. Now you mentioned rope dart a few times. I know what that is, but I'm going to guess we have at least a few listeners out there who are saying, what the heck is a rope dart? So maybe you can give us a little bit of a primer on what that is, because you're the first person on the show in 300 plus episodes to even mention that. Uh, well, that's awesome. Again, because I'm not balanced. Ding, ding, ding. Um, so the rope dart is, a, 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 I'll, I'll do my best to, to give a, a good snapshot. Uh, a rope dart is an ancient Chinese martial arts weapon. It also has its some roots in uh, Japanese martial arts as well, and I'll, I'll explain that in a second. But a rope dart is an ancient Chinese martial arts weapon, and it consists of a heavy object, usually a, a, a dart or a dagger head, or even like a, 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 
uh, an iron ball, like a melon head, on a long rope. And the idea is that it's basically something uh, to hit somebody with and also get it back. So instead of me just throwing a throwing knife at somebody and that's the end of the throwing knife, I can throw it, hit somebody, and of course I could retrieve it uh, back. And the Japanese version, uh, I believe, is called a kunai, where in Chinese they say shengbiao or feidao to, to describe rope dart. Okay. And when did you find that? Was this something that uh, came man. through as part of your kung fu training? Well, I, I, you know, I tell you, it was a series of really odd events that got me, I got a rope dart in my hand, and uh, I'm happy to, to give you as quickly of a version as I can without sounding too long-winded. Um, but I was a full-time Kung Fu instructor at Master Perella's Kung Fu Center. So this is the, not only the school that I, the first Kung Fu school that I actually became a student in, but I also went on to become an instructor there. So uh, it was one night, this was back in 2005, and I, um, I'd finished up classes for the evening. I had gone home and, you know, took a shower and I was a little bit wired and that you're a martial artist. Sometimes you, you get done training, you go home and you just can't sleep. So I decided to go back to the school. I was like, oh, let me just train a little bit. I'll, I'll try this, try that, hit the bag, go through my forms, you know, all the typical stuff. And when I got there, my, uh, my former Sifu, uh, Sifu Michael Perella was actually on the floor. And he had a rope dart in his hand. And I, I just stood back and I was kind of watching it. And he did a, uh, what we call a wrap. So it, it seems like the rope dart is actually tied or around the person or it's bound around them. So he was in what we call a wrap. And I looked at him and, you know, he kind of made like a, a gesture, like it, it was tied around him. Then he went, bam, and he just threw it out. And it came like, you know, within a foot of my face. I jumped back. I was like, oh, my God, like, I, you know, what I, what I just witnessed was magic. Here was this thing that was wrapped around this guy, so far as I can tell, and it just magically became unwrapped, and he basically almost hit me in the face with it. Um, so that was really cool. And then he said, he asked me to point, uh, to pick out a focus mitt. We had our focus, you know, the training, the boxing mitts people hit. We had the, the focus mitts hanging on the wall. He asked me to pick one, and I, I pointed at no particular one. And from whatever it was, he was about 12, 15 feet away. And he just, you know, wound up, swung, and I, I am not kidding. This guy hit the exact target that I pointed at. Now, whether it was deliberate or accidental or a little bit of luck, I don't know. But that left such a huge impression on me. Uh, I, I had to know what this thing was. And, you know, I, I went home. You know, we, we talked. We did whatever. I didn't actually even let him on as to how interested and fascinated I was with this thing. Because I didn't want him to tell me, don't use it, you know. But no, you know, first your staff, and then your sword, and then this, and then after 10 years, the ropes are kind of a thing. I don't really believe in that philosophy. I think anybody can learn the ropes art at any time. But uh, I, I went into the school early the next day. I found it, and I just started playing with it. And, you know, the rest is what they say, history. There's a lot more steps that actually came to pass, but I don't want to get too long-winded on, on this story. So that was actually the first time I had ever seen that that weapon. And this was before YouTube was around. This was before Facebook. This is before anything on the internet was available. Um, I picked up a rope dart and started swinging it. Cool. Yeah. So it almost sounds, you know, here again, we're, we're focusing in, you know, kind of, you went from passionate about martial arts, well, you know, with the Ninja Turtles to a little more passionate about Taekwondo. As it got more focused, you had some instruction. Then you move over to Kung Fu. You're even more passionate. You're finding more what resonates for you. And now we get hyper-specific. We're talking about, you know, different variations, but really a single implement within the martial arts. And listeners, you can probably hear what I'm hearing in our guest voice, that further passion, that, that even higher, that elevated energy as you're talking about it. Is this something you, you were conscious of right off the bat and said, oh, my God, this is what I need to do with my life? Uh, yeah, to be totally straightforward with you, the second I picked it up, I told myself, I'm going to do something with this. I don't know what it is, and I know it's going to take a long time to do it, but you know, right now, I, I don't know what I want, but there was nothing 
in my life that ever spoke to me more than the ropes are, other than my, my beautiful fiance, who for whatever reason said yes to me. Um, <laughs> Nothing, nothing even comes close to the importance of uh, the rope dart in my life. I just knew it the second I picked it up. But I think a lot of people, with, when it comes to the rope dart, you either fall in love instantly, like you got hit with a rope dart from Cupid, or you don't. And that's what I seem to find is that people either love it or they're not into it. And for me, I fell madly head over heels in love with it. The first time I saw it, and then the First time I picked it up, the following morning, it was a match made in absolute heaven. I just fell in love with it. All right. Well, I know we're going to talk a little bit more about Rope Dart, and we're going to talk about how that's threaded itself through your life. But I have a couple other questions that I want to ask you as we move on. One of my favorite questions, the, the idea that martial artists have this unique ability, maybe not unique, an expanded ability to handle life's obstacles. I'd love for you to tell us about a time when life was challenging and how it was your martial arts training that you were able to utilize, whether that be physically or emotionally, to move through that obstacle. Okay. Um, so I'll go, I guess, you know, with apologies to your guests, I'll go with a real easy answer um, with regard to things that really happen. So, you know, as already mentioned, you know, we live, when I say we, I mean my, my fiance and I, Sarah, we live in Brooklyn. We're from Long Island. It's not always sunshine and rainbows. People get very aggressive. People try to, you know, do things. They try to start, you know, fights or nonsense. And um, it was actually something my, my fiance, Sarah, you know, tells people, you know, with regard to, you know, the two or three times that somebody, you know, whether they were drunk or high on drugs or whatever the hell it was, basically started with the two of us for no reason. And, you know, she points out that, dude, like, how do you stay so calm? Like, this person is screaming up and down and this and that, and they're just ready to fight. And I'm just standing there like, all right, dude, whenever you're ready. All right, dude, when it, like, whenever you want to go. Like, And I, I don't even really say that much. I just stand there and look at the guy. and You know, that usually diffuses the situation because I think there's something about my calmness that might be a little disconcerting for some people. I would imagine most people who are not trained, when they start jumping up and down and they want to fight somebody who also isn't trained, that other guy starts jumping up and down and it's this bark and then I bark louder and then he barks louder than me and then they bark, and it's just this back and forth. But I don't give those people a reaction. I don't give them whatever it is they're looking and And why would I anyway? I know that if push comes to shove, I need to stay calm in order to handle the situation. So, uh, you know, I would say that's probably one of the better examples of how martial arts in real life has helped me just stay calm and, and not, you know, not, not engage somebody the way they want. It's kind of like, I don't fight their fight. So if you, you know, you, I'm sure sparred or fought or competed, you don't fight the other guy's fight. You, you make him fight your fight. So that's what I do. And I even handle that in our, our, our organization. I use the term fight as not literal, but figuratively. I don't, I don't go the way people think I'm going to do it. They either do it the way I'm doing it or they can, they can leave. And, and I don't do business with them because I know what's best for me. I know what's going to help me win. And I use that term, you know, quote unquote win. Um, so I, I play by my rules. And that seems to be working out uh, fairly well. Of course, you need to, to collaborate with others. You have to work with others. I'm not saying that it's my way or the highway, but when push comes to shove in a fight or negotiation, I don't back down to, to whatever my stance is. And I would say that I 100% got that from the martial arts. No question. Mm. Nice. Now, when you reflect on all of the people that you've trained with, worked with, anyone that's had influence in your martial arts upbringing, who has been the most influential? The most influential is a, a man I have not even mentioned yet. Um, his name is Aquila Columbus or Zachary Aquila Columbus. And he was another instructor along with me at uh, Master Prelis Kung Fu Centers. And he was a guy that really understood Kung Fu, who really understood 
form and application. And a lot of people, a lot of martial artists, you know, in my opinion, they don't know the application to a technique of a form. So they just kind of make it up. And what, what Akilah taught me was, look, the moment you realize what a real application is, you know it. And if somebody says, this is the application to this technique in this form, and it doesn't make sense, just reject it immediately. And also look at the technique before, so that they're going to break down an application for me. Not only do I look at that technique, I need to look at the technique before in the form, which leads up to the technique we're discussing, and after, which is the final result or what that, that imaginary opponent's counter is. And this is stuff a lot of people don't say. It's not just, you know, I turn this way and hit this guy, and I turn that way and hit this guy. It's like that's not what it is. It's, you are turning and doing a dance with usually one other person who is countering everything that you're doing so that you're learning not only the form and its application, but you're learning the counter to it as somebody, you know, in, in the instance that somebody does it to you. But he just understood, Akilah understood martial arts in a way that was absolute genius. Let me tell you, real funny, genius level. We would watch nice. Jeopardy sometimes. This guy got, I, I'm not kidding, 95% of Jeopardy answers correct. And if he had the wrong answer, the person on the show also had the wrong answer. So in other words, the, the person, the contestant was also tricked by the question as he was. And he was also to, able to get 95% of the questions correct. And I was like, you need to go on Jeopardy, dude. Uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. I don't know what to tell you. you you'll, you'll win it. Um, and, you know, I, I don't, he never did so far as I can tell. But, um, but he just really showed me what martial arts really was, that it wasn't this Mickey Mouse thing where, oh, this is a, this up block. I'm blocking a downward chop strike. And he's like, no, you're throwing the guy. No, you're putting, you're putting him in a, in a wrist lock. No, you're snapping his neck. No, you, you do, you're putting him in a heel hook. All these things that it's like he took the Mickey Mouse out of martial arts and he put the martial in martial arts. And the guy was right on everything he said. So um, I would say he had more influence on me. Uh, the only other person that comes equally close would have to be Ray Longo, who, again, this guy taught me how to fight. He taught me how to stay calm, cool, collected in every situation. The guy, you know, he cared about you. He really, like, I didn't, it, there was no question as to whether or not Ray cared about you and your well-being and, and what you were doing and your progress. This guy cared and he's seen it all. So I would say Ray Longo, without a doubt, and then uh, Aquila Columbus had the most influence. And if I'm being fair, uh, Mike Perella, because I would not know what the rope dart was if it was not for Mike Perella. And I say that openly. There's no question about that. Hmm. Now let's flip that question. Who would you want to train with anywhere in the world, anywhere in time that you haven't? Wow. Okay. I could think of multiple people that I would say, um, Okay, well, Raymond Decker would be one of them who you might be aware he was a uh, uh, Muay Thai fighter. Uh, uh, Raymond Decker would be one of them because he just, uh, his style of fighting was just so, so I've, uh, Ray used to tell me that I have nice guy syndrome. So I had a hard time getting in a ring and sparring with people that were my friends. I had a hard time hitting them in the face and trying to kick them and hurt them. Uh, they didn't have so much of a hard time trying to do it to me, but Ray always said that I had nice guy syndrome. So I, I would imagine studying under uh, uh, Decker would give me maybe more of an aggressive approach to fighting, which, you know, of course you have to be aggressive in a fight. Um, so he would be one. Kenny Florian, one of my all-time favorite UFC fighters, all-time Kenny Florian. I was a huge fan of him then. I, I thought he was a great fighter. I think we have similar builds. I think we have similar approaches when fighting. Uh, I would say Kenny Florian is like number, yeah, definitely top five, uh, top five guys I'd want to train with. Um, now the great Dennis Brown, I, I actually have a nice uh, friendly acquaintance, uh, dare I say friendship. That's probably more me saying it than he might say it. But Dennis Brown, who so far as I can tell, is, you know, responsible. He's, the, he's basically the father of rope dart in America. And, hmm. yeah, 
And uh, he's down in the, the D.C. area. And I've met him on a few occasions. He's always uh, nice. He loves what we're doing with the Rope Dart Academy. But I've never actually got to train with him. And if I could tell you, man, if, if I had an hour to just rope dart with him and just shoot the breeze and talk about things, that would probably be – I'm going to go with Sifu Dennis Brown on this one, i got to be honest with you. Because while the other martial artists that I mentioned, that would be awesome, they don't, they don't have – or, or they, they, they don't know what I'm trying to do with regard to the rope dart. And I, you know, if you're trying to do something big, find somebody that has already done it and, you know, copy what they did, I would have to go with Dennis Brown. So that's my long winded answer to a very straightforward question. I would want to train with Dennis Brown, bar none. Absolutely. You know, I never critique anyone for having long winded answers. It's kind of a hallmark of the show. My job is to just kind of, keep you talking and get out of the way and you're doing a great job with that so please don't don't sweat it you are welcome to be as long-winded and circuitous as you would like to be but you know you've alluded to and i think it's a good time to talk about this that you have some ties to rope dart not just as a martial art but kind of professionally i, I believe you you phrase it as things you are doing with rope dart so maybe this is a yeah. good time to tell the listeners what you've got going on, because it might interest them. Okay. Um, so uh, we have our company. It's an organization called the Rope Dart Academy. It's a network of instructors all over the world that work together to bring the rope dart, proper instruction, uh, great gear to, to, the, to the masses. Uh, we also make all of our own gear as well. Uh, we make them in-house. One of our co-founders, uh, Philip Passant up in Quebec City also makes some of our gear. Um, <clears throat> Raven Bane Firecraft makes our fireheads. So the rope dart transcends the martial arts in that uh, there is an entire community of fire spinners, fire performers, you know, fire dancers that are into the rope dart. And it was funny because the story here is it's a little bit whatever. It's a straightforward story. I um. I was strictly into martial arts rope dart. I loved it, you know, and I was doing it for years. When YouTube came out, now we're talking just about five years after I picked up the rope dart for the first time, you know, there's a couple of videos on YouTube, really not that many. I remember what it, when it first came out, if you search rope dart on YouTube, it was as long as one page, one YouTube page. That was it. <laughs> and it wasn't even full. And... Um, I remember seeing a video of a fire spinner and he was giving a recap of one of the classes he taught at a fire festival. And with all due respect, this guy was awful. And he, he wasn't a good instructor. He didn't understand the rope dart in any real sense that he should be teaching it. And he was still very much a student and I'm still a student too. Don't get me wrong. Even today, I'm, I'm still learning from everybody, but this guy was like a, a noob, a beginner student. And he was teaching the rope dart, and I literally, literally gasped, and I was like, oh, my God, he's got this many views, and people are watching this? I was like, this is garbage. So I, um, I contacted the festival, and I didn't mention, you know, how bad their instructor was. I just said, hey, I, I'm interested in getting involved, um, and the reason I wanted to get involved is because I saw some really, really terrible, terrible McDojo-style instruction going on, and I was like, I need to jump in there and basically save these people from themselves. Um, so then I started teaching at fire festivals and what I found was that the fire dancers that wanted to learn the rope dart were as keen, were as disciplined, was as enthusiastic, even more so than any martial artist I had encountered up until that point. And I was like, wow, these guys are really cool. And they, they break away a little bit from the traditional style of rope dart and go towards more of a dancey, explorative conceptual thing and for me that means growth in in a rope like you know it's like if you put a a, a a pumpkin in a glass jar it's going to grow to the size of the glass jar it's not going to get any bigger so by keeping the rope dart strictly as a martial art yeah it's cool but the techniques weren't actually expanding there wasn't that universal growth that's prevalent all throughout nature it stayed relatively the same for a long time and then when it was opened up to fire performers and 
uh, people who just like to, it has a, there's a lot of people that rope dart as a hobby the, or, or as fitness because it's for, uh, for exercise. It's better. It's way better than going on a treadmill or an elliptical. I'll tell you that much when it comes to cardiovascular endurance. Uh, you're sweating. It's a full body workout, full body exercise. As a matter of fact, we hooked somebody up to a, um, it's called my zone and it reads your heart rate and your calories burn everything uh to philip Hassan, one of our our co-founders up in quebec city he rope darted um intensely for about an hour and he ended up burning 700 calories which is twice of what you would burn running on a treadmill so the rope dart has a place in so many different areas of uh of uh, self-exploration of hobbyist things of that nature but um, I found that the fire spinning world, the flow arts world, they talk to the rope dart the way a martial artist would. They had a very, I can't speak for all of them. There's going to be some goofballs everywhere, including in the martial arts world. I could think of a couple off the top of my head in the, in the flow scene <laughs> of the rope dart world. But, um, you know, there's always going to be those goofballs. But other than that, the majority of fire spinners, they take it super duper seriously. And for a guy like me, that just sings to my heart. It really does. Nice. Nice. I don't know if I answered your question. I, I, I don't know I that you did either. <laughs> I don't know that you did either. And so that's kind of what I'm considering here. Let's let's kind of jump in and, and let's let's call it more the, the commercial time. I told you that we would have that section. Listeners know that we, we do give our, all of our guests that opportunity as we near the end. What resources are available to people that want to learn more about the rope dart? Uh, so if anybody wants to learn more about the rope dart, they should go to ropedarts.com. It's rope darts, R-O-P-E-D-A-R-T-S.com. That's the official Rope Dart Academy website. And we have online training. So I, I again, with regard to, so I used to be a, um, a, a school teacher. I have a, a degree in science and phys ed, uh, a master's degree in that, and I used to be a school teacher, so when it comes to teaching, I um, that that is a point of pride. Dare I say, um, something that I try really hard to do well, and I've developed a. So there's this idea that the rope dart is this impossible, difficult weapon, and it's not. It really isn't. Anybody can learn the rope dart. I think a lot of that has to do with instructors keeping it away from their students just because the instructor themselves actually don't know how to use a rope dart. So they just say, oh, you got to wait, you got to wait. Where, you know, they're flipping through trying to figure it out themselves. Um, so we have uh, our online training. It's a step-by-step comprehensive. If you've never picked up a rope dart before, there is no better training. I've bought the DVDs that are available. Actually, I, I, I made my online training. I looked at what those DVDs were saying and doing, and I'm doing the exact opposite. You don't ever have to have picked up a rope dart in your life. If you start at video one, I think there's 38 videos. By the time you get to 38, you are rope darting like you would not believe. Um, so ropedarts.com. Um, if you go to Supercat40 on YouTube, that's my personal YouTube channel. I have tournament videos, instructional videos, theoretical and principal videos. Any, it's all the rope. It's my personal page. It only has to do with rope dart stuff. And then the Rope Dart Academy page on YouTube also has, geez, over 100 tutorial videos, but they're not in any kind of real order. So the online training on our website, it's in a comprehensive order. It starts at square one, and it, it basically builds you a house that allows you to furnish it and paint it however you like. Whereas on YouTube, it's a little bit like you're kind of just grabbing at different things. And, you know, hopefully if you stick around long enough, you'll understand a full concept, whereas the online training, it's, you know, from beginning to end, soup to nuts, I think the best thing you could ever do, you just, it's an instant access. You, it's like a, you buy a DVD, but instead of a DVD waiting to arrive at your home, you purchase it, and there you go. You have access to the videos. Nice. And of course, anybody that's new to the show, we do link all of this stuff over on our show notes, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Cool. All right. So we've we've got all that there. We went a little bit out of order, so there are a couple more short questions I want to ask you. You mentioned that you're a teacher, and you know we started off talking about your love for the Ninja Turtles. So I'm curious about how you look at 
martial arts in, let's call it popular culture, movies, TV, books? Are there any of those entertainment genres that you look at and you say, you know, when it comes to this movie or this show or this book, you know, these are things that I enjoy and I would encourage the listeners to check out? Uh, yeah. So, you know, I would say I have both sides of both sides of that. Um, there's some things that, you know, some things when it comes to application, history, things of that people get fundamentally incorrect. Um, you know, I like, um, you know, I read Kung Fu Tai Chi magazine. Um, I think they do a great job with sharing the arts with, with others. I I don't think there's any substitute for finding people who are, are like real seafoods, real students who, who, have or are doing what you want to do and seeking them out as opposed to just kind of saying, Oh, you know, I'm going to read this article that, you know, on a, you know, somebody wrote this article about martial art application and, you know, it's just fundamentally incorrect. And this person really doesn't know what they're talking about. Um, I, I go straight to the source, you know, as you mentioned earlier, it, you know, we basically can't hide. It's 2018. Everybody's exposed on the internet. There's nowhere for anybody to go. So if, for any listener that's interested in, you know, doesn't have to be the ropes art, just any kind of martial art, for you to find the, you know, the big kahuna, if you will, of that art and reach out to them, email, Facebook, whatever, LinkedIn, there's so many avenues, reach out and, and say, hey, I, I love your, you know, your monkey style kung fu. And I've always wanted to learn monkey style kung fu. You know, is what's the best way for me to move forward. I, I think you just reach out directly to the people because we can nowadays, you know, 20 years ago, we didn't have that luxury today. We do. I, I, I reach out directly to the people. I say, Hey, this is who I am. This is what I'm doing. I like what you're doing. Let's do it together. Kind of a thing. Exactly. Cool. Yeah. And now what are your goals? Not just for rope dart, but, but for life, for your own training, when you look out five, 10, 20 years, what are you looking to accomplish? So um, my goals are all, again, that, that not being balancing. All of my goals are ropes are related. They, they, they truly are. And looking out, I would love a, you know, a space. We don't actually have an official studio, if you will. But somewhere down the line, I would like to, to have that. But my, my goal right now and will forever be is um, spreading the rope dart across the world the same way other People have done it with other things, um, you know, take snowboarding, for example, or you know, skateboarding or, any, or yo-yo or anything like that. The way it went from this subculture kind of niche thing to a mass scale, people are doing it. People are enjoying it. It's growing. It has that universal law of growth. That is my goal is to bring the rope dart to the world and to not sound too cliche, make it a household name. And that is, it's, it, you know, it's been 13 plus years of me doing that, but I am starting to see that, you know, it, it is catching on, you know, I used to go and for years and years and years, no matter what I did, nobody knew what it was. And now people are starting to know what it is. And without tooting my own horn. And I, I, I say this, I don't know, like, I feel weird saying it, but it's, it, it is true. I go to other countries now and people are like, Hey, wait, you're Frank Hatzis. And it's like, oh, wow, they can't even speak English and they actually know my name. Now, it's in, you know, festival type places. It's not like I was shopping in a supermarket and little Johnny <laughs> pointed me out, you know, to just to stay within reason and keep me grounded and my ego in check. I'm in, you know, places that would be interested in the rope dart. But the fact that they, they even know what it is and they know who I am and that they thank me for doing what I'm doing. Um, that means that I am getting closer and closer to my goal of making the rope dart. Uh, you know, it's a, a mainstream thing. It, it's not, it, it is for everyone. I think it's great for kids. Um, it gave me confidence in myself. It gave me self-esteem that I didn't have until I started rope darting. And I, I truly believe that I can give that to anybody because when you rope dart, you're a bad ass, And that's great. That's it. You are a bad ass when you rope dart. So when I walk into a room, I don't care where I am on this planet. When I walk into a room, that's exactly how I feel. And I think that can do that for anybody. It can make anybody feel more confident if they stick, uh, stick with it long enough. So my goal is to get a rope dart in everybody's hands 
so that they can see the benefit of it. And, um, and I'm just going to keep working towards that, that goal. And that, that is a lifelong goal. And, uh, you know, it's kind of like, you know, there's a question. It's like, well, you know, how, how old will you be when you reach that goal? And my, my answer to that is, well, how old will I be if I don't reach that goal? So, I'm going to keep doing it, and uh, I don't plan on stopping. My goal, my dream, my aspirations is to spread the rope dart across the world to be able to provide the best service possible, to provide the best instruction possible, and to also furnish rope darters with the best gear. We make all our gear. I design our gear. I think I have a lot of experience and knowledge. My gear is designed to help folks learn the rope dart. Uh, A mistake people make is they just, you know, they tie anything at the end of a rope thinking that that'll suffice. And it's like, well, for a, you know, a real quick thing that you want to try, maybe, but once you start getting into advanced things, the things like proper weight, balance, distribution, length of rope, all of this stuff comes into play and people end up limiting themselves or thinking they can't do it because they're using, um, an improper setup, if you will. So I guess another part of my goal is to, educate people on the proper, not only proper instruction of the rope dart, but educate them on the proper setup of what a rope dart should actually feel like, what it should fly like, how to get the results you want with it. If you, if you have something that's not really aerodynamic or something that's bouncy and springs back at you, you're not going to get that. You're not going to get the results you want. So to just tie anything to a rope. Yeah. For your first day or two. Sure. But you know, you don't have to get a rope dart from me. I'm not trying to sell you anything, but get a rope dart from somebody who actually knows how to build a rope dart and what it's actually supposed to feel like. Awesome. Well, I appreciate your time here today. I appreciate you being so generous, sharing your story with me, with everybody that's been listening. But I have one more request, one more question for you as we head out. And that would be what parting advice, what words of wisdom would you want everyone listening to hear? It's going to sound redundant, but when I decided to stop being a school teacher, which, you know, for a lot of people is a a great career and it's really safe and they take care of you. I got a lot of pushback from family. I got a lot of pushback from friends, people questioning me, people virtually laughing in my face. I had an ex-girlfriend laugh in my face um, saying that, you know, my dream to you know, be somebody and share the rope throw with the world was basically a joke. Um, and I didn't listen. So my words of wisdom to anybody listening now, if you're going to listen to anything, uh, listen to this. Don't listen to the naysayers. And that's something Arnold Schwarzenegger said. That's something the greatest stage of it, stages of history say. Do not listen to the people who tell you no. You know your, your spiritual path. You know your goals in life better than anybody ever will. And had I listened to the, listen, you think my mom said, hey, great, Frank, quit being a school teacher and start rope starting. She didn't say that. She cried. My dad was pissed at me. People laughed at me. They're not laughing now, I'll tell you that much. Do not listen to people who tell you you can't do it. You can do it. If I could do it or, or, or at least be in the throes of doing it with something as obscure as a rope dart, with something that people haven't even heard of, then you can do it with something even more obscure. You could do it with something less obscure. Do not listen to the people who say no, that you're wrong. They will, you, listen, listen, the greatest form of revenge is massive, massive amounts of success. Do not listen to anybody. Don't let the physical plain stuff, the bank account, the people telling you you're wrong, whatever it is, do not let the physical plane noise disrupt the spiritual plane goal or dream. If your dream that's on your spiritual plane, that this thing you want to do is a white, hot, burning desire, as Napoleon Hill would say, you stick to that and you stick to your gun. Look, I don't eat some days. I don't, shiv- pardon me. I don't care. I, I don't, I've worn, worn the same sneakers for a year now. They got holes in them. I don't go out to expensive dinners. I don't do any of that stuff but I understand the way the law of nature and the universe works and it all comes back and you need to lay yourself down. Sometimes you need to sacrifice big. Sometimes the bigger, the risk, the bigger, the sacrifice, the greater the reward will be. 
It's not often that, here we are, episode 314, that we have someone talking about something new. Here, Mr. Hatzis, with the rope dart, that's, that's pretty new. That's pretty, I don't want to say unique in the world of martial arts, but it's unique, at least in the history of this show. And I think it's a perfect way to prove that martial arts has space for everyone, regardless of what they are passionate about. Thank you for sharing so much of your story with us today, Mr. Hatzis. Now, I hope everybody's going to check out all the stuff that he's got going on. It's, it's a lot. It's, there's a lot of really cool stuff. As a reminder, we receive no incentive, no kickbacks, no commission, no, nothing like that. I just see a man who is passionate about martial arts, and he's making a business out of it. And I want to support that, because guess what? That's what I'm doing, too. And I appreciate when all of you and others support me and the team that we have here at Whistlekick. You can find the show notes at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, including links to everything we talked about today, all of Mr. Hatzis's links. And you can find everything that we've got going on over at whistlekick.com. We recently revamped the wholesale program. It's now simpler, no separate website, and you can even get discounts on the apparel for the first time. So check that out. That's all I've got today. I'd love for you to reach out to us. I'm Jeremy at whistlekick.com. Our social media is at whistlekick. And until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. <laughs>